following video contains scenes that some viewers may find disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome to Criminality. Let's take a dive into the forensic files and the science behind solving a crime. The legendary serial killer Henry Lee Lucas, also referred to as the Confession Killer, stunned the country with his crimes. Lucas, who was born in 1936, grew up in a difficult home and had a lengthy history of violence. He declared that he had killed hundreds of individuals around the nation, frequently relating gory details of his atrocities. You are going to hear the horrific story of Henry Lee Lucas, who was thought to have killed his mother, his girlfriend who was 15 years, and over 300 other people. It's a story of a horrible childhood, unbelievable deceit, an alleged mass killer, and a lot of controversy in his current position in law enforcement. This is the tale of the confession killer Henry, who was born in 1936 to a mother who was a prostitute as well as an alcoholic in Blacksburg, Virginia. His seven siblings preceded him, and the facts of his upbringing are rather somber. He went into a three-day coma at the age of eight when his mother beat him over the head with a wooden plank. At the age of 10, Lucas and his brother got started a fight, and as a result, Lucas lost one of his eyes. She wanted him to join the family business in an effort to mold him into her lifestyle so that he could later work as a prostitute for both men and women. On the other side, his father illegally produced and sold alcohol, and after being severely intoxicated during a snowstorm, he passed away from hyperthermia. In the sixth grade, Lucas eventually dropped out of high school while escaping his house. He then began carrying out a number of burglaries. Additionally, some claim that he murdered his first victim at this time, a 17-year-old female who disappeared in 1951. Even though he confessed to the crime, he was not found a criminal since he later withdrew his sincere confession. As you'll soon enough, Lucas's pattern led to a four-year prison term for the burglaries. Shortly following his release, he relocated to Michigan to establish a life with his half-sister. This is the point at which Lucas's story began to go badly. When Lucas was living with his sister in January 1969, his mother made him a visit. He heading back to Virginia to look after she was the subject of an annoyed disagreement between them. After she hit Lucas over the head with a broom, things became so hot that Lucas stabbed her. She was dead almost immediately. Despite Lucas's self-defense justification, he was ultimately given a 40-year prison term. But 10 years later, as a result of prison overload, he was allowed to go. However, 10 years in jail failed to discourage him from continuing his wicked actions. He was found guilty of attempting to kidnap three schoolgirls in 1979. His sentence was three and a half years in prison. When he was allowed to leave prison, he relocated to Pennsylvania and married Betty Crawford there. His two-year marriage ended when Betty discovered that he had assaulted her young daughters. By this time, he was moving about from state to state until becoming friends with Otis O'Toole. And they both collaborated in a Jacksonville, Florida, roofing business from 1979 to 1981. Becky Powell, and O'Toole's niece, was a young girl at the time. According to Lucas, he fell into a passionate relationship with Becky Powell and encouraged her to come to Texas along with him at which point they began their employment as caretakers for Kate Rich. Becky was 15 at the time, keep in mind. Lucas killed Becky in August 1982, and three weeks later, he killed Kate Rich. Later, a Texas Ranger arrested him for being in possession of a gun. Following some time spent with the police, he admitted to the murders of Becky and Kate Rich. He even led the Rangers to the spot where he buried their dead, where they discovered skeletal remains. They were all human, but it's not known if any of them belonged to the claim victims. He continued to confess after giving his statement about Kate and Becky's death. And at this point, he truly transformed into the confession killer. As he began to confess to numerous killings across the nation and claimed to have killed more than 100 people, 
Lucas rose to international attention in November 1983. Lucas admitted to being in charge of them all. Now, the reason Lucas was so open was because the police were giving him special treats. He could smoke as many cigars as he liked, and every day he got a strawberry milkshake. Lucas subsequently confessed to a large number of crimes, and the greater number of murders he admitted to, the better treatment he received. He spoke with more than a thousand law enforcement representatives from all over the nation in the hopes that Lucas was going to confess to a killing that had gone unsolved in their county. Lucas went so far as to say that he had accepted God, which prompted him to admit to these crimes. He claimed that Jesus had informed him in a prison cell that he needed to confess to all of these killings in order to provide comfort to the families of the victims. He was found guilty of 11 homicides, although one, in particular, stood out. It was a really awful moment. Deborah Jackson was murdered in this manner. She was referred to at the time as the Orange Sox case. When the woman's body was found, she was wearing a pair of orange socks. When Lucas admitted to killing Deborah, the death sentence was an option. However, something about his confession seemed illogical. Deborah Jackson was murdered in Texas, while Henry was working in Florida at the time. So there was no way that he could have killed her. But Lucas insisted on making that claim in court, which outraged his defense team because the facts pointed in a different direction. Later, Lucas recanted his admission, claiming that he was in charge of the murder. When he learned he was destined to die, he smiled the entire way to the police scar. Then the reporter, Hugh Ainsworth, started his investigation. He was aware of how serial killers operated. He saw that Henry's selection of his victims lacked any clear pattern. His crimes seemed to occur far too frequently, and many of them took place in various states. Some of them happened only a few days apart. If he had committed each of these offenses, then, he would have needed to travel all the time. At this point, some of Henry's statements were being brushed aside by the media as a hoax. However, the Texas Rangers stated that all of his assertions were true, and Vic Fiesel, a district attorney, became interested in this. Fiesel worked as a lawyer. Lucas couldn't be held responsible for a few of these deaths, including the ones in McLennan County, he discovered after conducting his investigations. He disclosed that all law enforcement officials, including the Texas police. Then they also recruited local attorneys to say that they had bribed Fiesel and defamed him, leading to the arrest of Fiesel on false charges by the FBI. He was ultimately exonerated of all accusations, despite Fiesel's claims that Fiesel was a dishonest lawyer. Fiesel then sued the station and received a $58 million restitution payment. Henry didn't do many of the offenses he'd admitted to, as was further demonstrated by the dubious tactics of the Texas police. He had been misrepresented. He acknowledged that he had only ever killed his mother. Former President George W. Bush served as governor of Texas at the time, and he judged that the evidence linking Henry to the killings was insufficient. As a result, Lucas's sentence was changed from death row to life in prison. The remainder of Henry Lee Lucas' life was spent behind bars and passed away on March 12, 2000 from congestive heart failure. Their remains were interred in the Captain Joe Bird Cemetery. That brings us to the end of this video. Thanks for being to the end of the video. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and tell us what you think about this video below in the comment section.